This is section three in the nephrology chapter. In this section, we will be talking about the function of the nephron. This particular section is divided into two parts. The first part, this video, will be focused on the functions of the different parts of the nephron. In the next video, we will focus on the nephron as a whole. So let's get started on the nephron. Immediately after the glomerulus has filtered the plasma, the proximal convoluted tubule, or PCT, has the chance to then reabsorb most of the substances secreted into the lumen, such as glucose, amino acids, electrolytes, and urea. The proximal tubule is also the location of bicarb reabsorption, which has implications for acid-base balance. The proximal tubule also reabsorbs phosphate, which is discussed thoroughly in the endocrine chapter. Phosphate reabsorption plays a significant role in calcium homeostasis and bone development. The proximal tubule also generates and secretes ammonia, which then buffers protons which are filtered from the glomerulus. As ammonia binds up these protons, molecules of ammonium are generated, NH4 with a positive charge. So let's first discuss bicarb reabsorption. So here I will draw cells of the proximal convoluted tubule. I'll draw it on both sides and just write PCT. And on this side, we have the lumen or urine. And on this side, we have the blood and the interstitium. So in the lumen here, that's where the solutes are located, which the glomerulus just filtered from the blood. Okay, so now within the proximal tubule cells are molecules of CO2 and water. Carbonic anhydrase, written here as Ca, then combines these molecules of CO2 and water to form carbonic acid, H2CO3. Carbonic acid then dissociates into two molecules, acid and bicarb. Bicarb is then reabsorbed on the basal lateral side of the cell to then enter the blood. The hydrogen will then be secreted into the lumen using a sodium hydrogen antiporter. So I'll draw that right here. The sodium in the lumen then enters the cell in exchange for hydrogen. So now we have secreted hydrogen into the urine. Meanwhile, the glomerulus is filtering the plasma which contains bicarb. The hydrogen will then combine with the bicarb to form carbonic acid. Again, H2CO3. Carbonic anhydrase on the cell surface will then convert this com carbonic acid into two molecules. Again, that is CO2 and H2O. And then CO2 and H2O will then diffuse into the cell and start this process all over again. It is important to recognize that this process did not actually cause a net secretion of hydrogen because, as you can see, one hydrogen was secreted. It combined with a bicarb, which had a hydrogen ion, so now there are two, as you can see in this carbonic acid. Both of these hydrogen atoms then re-enter the cell as water. The point is that there was no net secretion of acid. However, there was a net reabsorption of bicarb, because the bicarb that was filtered was able to come back into the blood. Thus, using this mechanism in the proximal tubule, the body has the ability to adjust the pH of the blood. By bringing in bicarb, the pH increases, becoming more alkalotic. Now the relevance of the reabsorption of bicarb from the proximal tubule is discussed in great detail in the acid-base lecture of this chapter. Now let's focus a little more on the sodium hydrogen antiporter on the luminal surface. So here is the proximal convoluted tubule. We'll draw a few cells. And on this side is the lumen or urine. And on this side is the blood and interstitium. And here is the sodium hydrogen antiporter. So sodium enters the cell and hydrogen is secreted from the cell. So if you stimulate this pump, this sodium hydrogen antiporter, what would happen to the serum pH and water reabsorption? So I will write this question up here in the top. So pH and water reabsorption. And we'll come back to that.
Okay, so if you are stimulating this sodium hydrogen antiporter, you would secrete more hydrogen, which would then bind up the bicarb that's been filtered. And then from this, the carbonic anhydrase would create more CO2 and water, which, as we discussed before, can then diffuse back into the cell. And then the carbonic anhydrase in the cell can convert this back into hydrogen and bicarb. And this would lead to an, an increase in bicarb reabsorption. What would bicarb reabsorption do to the pH? It would increase it. So all because you stimulated this sodium hydrogen antiporter. So that answers part of our question. pH has been increased. Now what would happen to the reabsorption of water? In order to answer this, we need to look at sodium. If you're stimulating this pump, then sodium reabsorption would increase. And so there will be more sodium in the cell. And as a quick side note, on the basal lateral side of the cell, there is a sodium potassium pump or antiporter. So that takes sodium and reabsorbs it into the blood in exchange for potassium, which is brought into the cell. The point I'm making is that it's through this pump that sodium that's in the cell is ultimately reabsorbed into the blood. Okay, so what happens to the reabsorption of water? So this brings up a really important thing to remember. Water follows sodium. Remember that. Water follows sodium. So water can follow sodium by entering through the paracellular space, or as we discussed before, water can diffuse into the cell and be reabsorbed into the blood that way. The point is that by stimulating the sodium hydrogen antiporter, you will have an increase in sodium reabsorption and an increase in water reabsorption, which answers our next question. Water reabsorption increases. Can you name the hormone that stimulates this antiporter? Angiotensin II. That stimulates this antiporter. Angiotensin II is discussed in greater detail in section four of this chapter. It's also important to recognize that ammonia is synthesized here in the proximal tubule. Ammonia acts as a buffer for the protons that are filtered from the glomerulus. So ammonia will bind up the acid to become ammonium, and H4 with a positive charge. This is an important way the kidneys can maintain a normal urine pH. Ammonia as a buffer is discussed later in this lecture as well as in the acid base lecture. Now let's quickly discuss phosphate reabsorption. So here is the proximal convoluted tubule. I'll write PCT at the top. And the lumen is on this side. And the blood and interstitium is on this side. Okay, so the glomerulus will filter phosphate from the blood, which will enter the lumen of the nephron. Phosphate is then reabsorbed into the proximal tubule using a sodium phosphate symporter. So sodium enters the proximal tubule with phosphate. And once in the blood, phosphate can then bind to calcium. And this will help make new bone. So what would phosphate reabsorption do to the free calcium level? Well, it would decrease because phosphate binds calcium. So in states of low free calcium, PTH will be released. And the goal of PTH is to increase levels of free calcium. And part of the way it does this is by decreasing phosphate reabsorption. In fact, it blocks the sodium phosphate symporter, leading to excretion of phosphate, thus raising the serum calcium level. So notice how phosphate enters the cell using a sodium symporter. This is a mechanism used by other substances that are reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. So let's delve into that more on a new slide. Sodium is reabsorbed using symporters, as discussed previously. For example, sodium is reabsorbed using a sodium phosphate symporter, a sodium glucose symporter, or a sodium amino acid symporter. Now, each one of these substances uses their own specific transporter, but for simplicity, we will just show them all using the same symporter. The point is that these substances enter the cell with sodium. Something absolutely critical to this mechanism and understanding it is that sodium is going down its concentration gradient. In other words, sodium is very high in the lumen and low in the cell. 
As sodium goes down its concentration gradient, it will use these symporters, which act to reabsorb phosphate, glucose, and amino acids. What keeps sodium low in the cell? Well, on the basal lateral side, on this proximal tubule, there's a sodium potassium pump. So this pumps sodium out of the cell, returns it to the blood in exchange for potassium. So this pump allows the proper reabsorption of sodium from the urine as well as phosphate, glucose, and amino acids. Now let's focus more on sodium. Most of the sodium is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule using these symporters. In fact, around 65% of sodium is reabsorbed here. Recall that water follows sodium in a one-to-one -one fashion. So if 65% of sodium is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, then 65% of the water will be reabsorbed here as well. And recall that water can enter through this paracellular space. And as water moves through this space, it drags with it other ions, such as calcium, potassium, and chloride. And this is known as solvent drag. We will discuss in more detail the reabsorption of each of these solutes in the next lecture, but now it's just important to know that the majority of these ions are reabsorbed here in the proximal tubule. Now before we move on, it's important to know that urea is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. This is done using simple diffusion, so we don't need to draw out any pumps or anything like that. And diffusion, again, is just going from a high concentration to a low concentration. And urea is freely filtered from the glomerulus into the lumen, and 50% of it is reabsorbed here. So I'll write urea and 50%. And urea will be discussed in great detail in part two of this lecture. The reabsorption of glucose is extremely high yield, so we will delve into that now. Glucose is freely filtered by the glomerulus. It is then reabsorbed from the urine by the proximal convoluted tubule. All of the glucose is reabsorbed until the sodium glucose transporters that we discussed in the previous slide are overwhelmed and maxed out. This point is called transport maximum, or TM. Beyond this point, any additional filtered glucose is excreted in the urine as waste. So let's draw this out and apply it. Okay, so I will draw the glomerulus. We'll have the afferent arterial here, the efferent arterial here. And I'll draw some proximal convoluted tubule cells, PCT, and over here as well. We'll have the urine on this side and the blood and interstitium on this side. Okay, so glucose in the blood right, GLU, is freely filtered from the glomerulus and into the urine. And glucose is freely filtered by the glomerulus without limitation. That means that the greater the level of glucose in the blood, the greater the level of glucose that will be filtered into the urine. Glucose will then be reabsorbed from the urine into the proximal convoluted tubule using a sodium symporter. We already discussed sodium symporters in the previous slides, but this particular sodium symporter is called a sodium glucose linked transporter, or SGLT. Once in the cell, glucose can leave the proximal tubule and be reabsorbed using a GLUT2 transporter. It can then be reabsorbed into the blood. In normal circumstances, there will be plenty of sodium glucose symporters, so all of the glucose will be reabsorbed and none will be excreted. However, if there is so much glucose, that all of the glucose sodium symporters are being used, as drawn here, then any extra glucose will be excreted as urine. The point at which all of these transporters are saturated or maxed out is known as transport maximum. The concept of transport maximum is extremely high yield and can be depicted on a glucose titration curve. So let's go over that on a new slide. So let's draw this glucose titration curve. So on the x-axis, we are measuring plasma glucose concentration in milligrams per deciliter. And we will just illustrate it in increments of 200. On the y-axis, we will measure rates. So it will be milligrams per minute. So the first line we will draw is filtration rate. Then I'll draw reabsorption rate on another line. And the third and final line we will draw is excretion rate. So let's go through these one by one. We'll just erase them. Just so everything is clear as we discuss the graph, 
let's draw the glomerulus and the proximal tubule. So we'll draw the glomerulus here, proximal tubule right here. And the first line we will draw is the filtration rate of glucose. But before we do, recall that the filtration rate is proportional to the plasma concentration of a substance. So if you have glucose in the blood coming through the glomerulus, it will freely filter into the urine. Therefore, an increase in plasma concentration will proportionally increase the filtration rate, which creates this linear line. So it doesn't matter how much glucose is in the blood, the glomerulus will filter it. Next, we will discuss the reabsorption rate of glucose. Understand that not every nephron in the kidney has the same amount of glucose transporters. So let's say that this particular nephron has fewer glucose transporters than the average nephron. So I will cross these two out. The point is that some of the glucose in this nephron will then be excreted as waste. And this point is called threshold. So we will draw threshold on the graph at about 250 milligrams per deciliter. We'll follow that up. So now let's draw the line demonstrating the reabsorption rate. It follows filtration rate until it reaches threshold and then begins to decrease. So as you can see, the line begins to decrease in slope, meaning that not all the glucose that is filtered will be reabsorbed. Whereas at a lower plasma glucose concentration, all that is filtered is also reabsorbed. As you can see, the rates match. As stated previously, every molecule of glucose that is not reabsorbed will be excreted. So as you decrease the reabsorption rate, as demonstrated with the decreased slope on the green line, you will begin an excretion rate. So now I will draw a red line to depict the excretion rate. As plasma concentration of glucose increases, more and more glucose will be filtered. And eventually, the transporters in every nephron will be saturated. I will draw some extra transporters here to properly depict the total transporters in the body. And then these transporters will be filled with glucose, and the remaining glucose will be excreted as waste. It is at this point when every transporter is saturated in every nephron that we have reached transport maximum, or TM. Transport maximum occurs at a plasma glucose concentration of about 350. So draw that right here. That means that beyond this point, every single increase in plasma glucose concentration will not increase the reabsorption rate. So the reabsorption rate will plateau as drawn here. Recall that each additional molecule of glucose that is not reabsorbed will be excreted. That means that beyond this point of transport maximum, every single increase in plasma concentration moving along the x-axis will actually increase the excretion rate. As you can see, at this point of transport maximum, the excretion rate matches the filtration rate. So let's say there is a newly diagnosed diabetic patient with a plasma glucose concentration of 200 milligrams per deciliter what would be the excretion rate? Well, as you can see, at a plasma glucose concentration of 200, threshold has not even been reached. So the transporters in the proximal tubule are fully able to reabsorb glucose. Therefore, although the patient has a high plasma glucose concentration at 200 milligrams per deciliter, they are not yet excreting glucose into the urine. Now let's review what your book states about the proximal tubule. So first, it's the site of bicarb reabsorption, and this helps the body maintain normal serum pH. Angiotensin II upregulates the sodium hydrogen antiporter, which then increases water reabsorption as well as serum pH. Sodium is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule using symporters such as sodium phosphate symporter, sodium amino acid symporters, and sodium glucose symporters. Recall that the name of the sodium glucose transporter is SGLT, and it's through these symporters that sodium is reabsorbed. In fact, 65% of the filtered sodium is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. The reabsorption of sodium will increase the reabsorption of water because water follows sodium. Water follows sodium. Remember that. And as water is reabsorbed in the paracellular space in the proximal tubule, it drags several ions with it. And these include potassium, chloride, and calcium. Urea is also reabsorbed by simple diffusion in the proximal tubule. And lastly, the proximal tubule can generate ammonia in order to buffer the acid that is filtered from the blood. For board examinations, it's best to think of the loop of Henle in two parts, the thin descending limb and the thick ascending limb. 
The thin descending limb passively reabsorbs water. And this is due to the high osmolarity of the medulla, which pulls water out of the urine. However, the thin descending limb is not permeable to sodium. This process of reabsorbing water, but not salt, increases the osmolarity of the urine. We will discuss the concentration of urine in great detail in part two of the nephron section, which is the next video. The thick ascending limb actively reabsorbs sodium, potassium, and chloride, but not water. So this actually decreases the osmolarity of the urine. The thick ascending limb also reabsorbs calcium and magnesium through the paracellular space. So now let's draw this out. Okay, so here's the glomerulus. Got the Bowman space and then the proximal convoluted tubule, the descending loop of Henle, the thick ascending limb, the distal convoluted tubule. We'll just complete this. And finally, we have the collecting duct over here. So we'll just label these really quick. Draw collecting duct and the proximal convoluted tubule over here. And then the descending thin limb right here. It doesn't look so thin in this sketch, but it's the descending thin limb. And then we have the thick ascending limb right here. And then finally the distal convoluted tubule right here. And now I'm just going to draw a line to distinguish the cortex from the medulla with the cortex up here and the medulla down here. So let's first focus on the descending thin limb. So the plasma travels through the glomerulus and it's then filtered creating urine. The urine travels down the loop of Henle and recall that this segment of the nephron is permeable to water. So water can leave and enter the interstitium. And the reason water will be reabsorbed here is because there's such a high osmolarity, high osmolarity here in the interstitium of the medulla. So water is reabsorbed here. Understand that water doesn't really enter the interstitium. Instead, it enters the vasa recta, or the blood supply for the loop of Henle. And we will discuss this in great detail in part two of this lecture. Right now, it's just important to recognize that water leaves the tubule. Recall that this part of the nephron is impermeable to sodium. So sodium stays in the tubule. In summary, the loss of water and the retention of sodium together act to concentrate the urine. So right, increased concentration or increased osmolarity to be consistent. It's also important to know that the descending limb is permeable to urea. So urea can leave the medullary interstitium to enter the loop of Henle. Do you recall where urea is reabsorbed? So 50% of urea is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule via diffusion so that it can then enter the paratubular capillaries. In any case, the secretion of urea from the medullary interstitium into the loop of Henle adds to the overall high tonicity of the urine at the bottom of the loop of Henle. Now let's focus on just the thick ascending limb. So the thick ascending limb has sodium, potassium, chloride co-transporters. And as the name implies, these cause the reabsorption of sodium, potassium, and chloride. And these are actively reabsorbed into the interstitium. However, water cannot be reabsorbed here because the thick ascending limb is impermeable to water. So by pumping in this salt, the thick ascending limb significantly contributes to the hypertonicity of the medulla, so increased osmolarity of the interstitium of the medulla. And this high osmolarity actually contributes to the ability of the descending limb to reabsorb water, as we discussed earlier. It's also important to know that calcium and magnesium are reabsorbed from the thick ascending limb as a result of this pump, the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. And we'll explain why. Okay, I will quickly draw some cells to represent the thick ascending limb. And of course, the urine or the lumen is on this side, and the blood and interstitium is on this side. Okay, so here is the sodium potassium chloride pump. So sodium 
gets reabsorbed, potassium gets reabsorbed, and chloride gets reabsorbed. And there's actually two atoms of chloride that are reabsorbed in this pump. And there's also a potassium channel on the same luminal surface of the cell. So as potassium is reabsorbed, it can actually leak back into the urine. And this creates a net positive charge in the lumen, or in the urine. Recall that calcium and magnesium are reabsorbed through a paracellular space here in the thick ascending limb. So with this net positive charge right here, calcium and magnesium here will follow down an electrical gradient and be reabsorbed back into the blood. And now let's take a closer look at the osmolarity of the urine. So let's go back to our previous slide. Okay, so we've been talking about the thick ascending limb. So the urine continues, and as it, it reaches the top of the thick ascending limb, or the beginning of the distal convoluted tubule, the urine has lost the majority of its salt while keeping the water. So the urine is very dilute. In fact, the urine has never been more dilute up to this point in the nephron. So now let's spend a little bit more time focusing on the distal convoluted tubule. The distal convoluted tubule, or DCT, reabsorbs sodium and chloride from the urine. This removal of electrolytes further dilutes the urine. The distal tubule also reabsorbs calcium. It does this by using a sodium-calcium antiporter on the basolateral side and a calcium channel on the luminal side. So let's draw this out. So here is the distal convoluted tubule. And I'll draw some cells. Right, DCT for distal convoluted tubule. And again, the urine or lumen is on that side while the blood and interstitium is on this side. So as mentioned previously, there is a sodium chloride symporter or co-transporter on the luminal side. So sodium just travels from its high concentration in the lumen to a low concentration in the cell. And as that happens, chloride is also reabsorbed. As discussed earlier in the lecture, the sodium in the cell is kept low, which helps allow for this gradient for sodium to be reabsorbed into the cell. And it's kept low using a sodium potassium pump on the basolateral side. So sodium is reabsorbed into the blood in exchange for potassium which enters the cell. And these sodium chloride pumps can actually be blocked by thiazide diuretics such as hydrochlorothiazide or HCTZ. So thiazide enters the blood, then the cell, and then it blocks this sodium chloride pump. This means that instead of entering the cell, sodium is excreted into the urine. And recall that water follows sodium. So greater excretion of sodium means greater excretion of water. This mechanism is why thiazide diuretics are so helpful for patients with heart failure and fluid overload. It helps the distal tubule to excrete water. Now calcium is also reabsorbed in the distal tubule. Let's explain how. So on the basal lateral side, there is a sodium calcium exchanger or antiporter. So sodium enters the cell in exchange for calcium, which gets reabsorbed into the blood. On the luminal side over here, there are calcium channels. So as calcium is removed from the cell on this side, the high level of calcium in the urine will then allow calcium to flow down its concentration gradient into the cell. And this is how calcium is reabsorbed by the distal tubule. Now let's touch briefly on parathyroid hormone, or PTH. Recall that PTH increases calcium reabsorption from the distal tubule. It does this by acting on a surface receptor. When stimulated, the surface receptor will upregulate adenylate cyclase, or AC here, leading to increased levels of cyclic AMP, which causes downstream effects. In this circumstance, the downstream effect of cyclic AMP is to increase the activity of the sodium-calcium exchange, causing an increase in calcium reabsorption. 
Now let's discuss the final part of the nephron, the collecting duct. The collecting duct has two main types of cells, the principal cells and the intercalated cells. There are two types of intercalated cells, the alpha intercalated cells and the beta intercalated cells. For the purposes of board preparation, we will focus primarily on the alpha intercalated cells. The principal cells secrete potassium and reabsorb sodium. And when aldosterone acts on the cell, potassium secretion and sodium reabsorption increase. When principal cells are acted upon by ADH, the principal cells can reabsorb water. Otherwise, the principal cells in the collecting duct are impermeable to water. But in the presence of ADH, they can reabsorb water. The alpha intercalated cells will secrete acid using a hydrogen ATPase as well as a potassium hydrogen exchanger. They will also reabsorb bicarb. Aldosterone upregulates this process to increase serum pH. So let's take a second to draw this out. So here is the collecting duct. On the top is the principal cell, alright, PC for short. And, on the, and lower, I've depicted the alpha intercalated cell, and I will just write an alpha sign. And like many of the other cells we have discussed, on the basal lateral side of the cell, there is a sodium potassium pump. And this acts to create a sodium gradient. The principal cells also have a sodium channel on the luminal side. The name of this channel is ENAC, or epithelial sodium channel. So, sodium travels from where it is in high concentration in the urine to a low concentration in the cell. So now let's take a moment to apply ADH to this segment. ADH will travel through the blood and act on a V2 receptor on the surface of the principal cell. This receptor will act via a second messenger system which uses adenylate cyclase, AC, to increase cellular levels of cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP then leads to the placement of aquaporins on the luminal surface. And this allows for the reabsorption of water. The point is that when ADH is high, water reabsorption is high. Now let's move on to potassium. Like sodium, potassium will travel through a luminal channel. However, unlike sodium, potassium will exit the cell where it is in high concentration to the urine where potassium concentration is low. Now let's take a moment to apply aldosterone to this segment. So unlike ADH, aldosterone, I will write aldo for short, aldosterone will act on an intracellular receptor. And this will ultimately lead to increased protein synthesis and upregulate the sodium potassium pump. The net effect of aldosterone on the principal cells is to increase sodium reabsorption and increase potassium secretion. Aldosterone is described in great detail in the endocrinology chapter. Now let's discuss specifically the alpha intercalated cell. So I'll just write alpha here for alpha intercalated cell. On the luminal side, there are two pumps to be aware of. One that secretes acid, and one that secretes acid in exchange for potassium. Both of these require ATP. On the basal lateral side, there is a pump which reabsorbs bicarbonate in exchange for chloride. And chloride is helpful simply because it helps maintain the charge in the cell and blood cells when you are shifting bicarb around. Now what will aldosterone do to the alpha intercalated cell? So just like in the principal cell, aldosterone will act on an intracellular receptor because it is a steroid. But in the alpha cell, it will upregulate hydrogen secretion. Increased hydrogen secretion will lead to an increased bicarb reabsorption via the bicarbonate chloride exchanger. The secretion of acid and the reabsorption of bicarbonate will increase serum pH. As a quick pathology tie-in, hyperaldosteronism will cause excess acid secretion and bicarb reabsorption, which is why patients with hypersecretion of aldosterone 
will have higher than normal pH. As mentioned earlier, this lecture laid out the processes of each of the parts of the nephron. However, nephron physiology is best understood as a whole, so in the next lecture we will dive more into the overall physiology of the nephron. The last topic in this section is renal tubular acidosis. All of the renal tubular acidosis disorders cause a metabolic acidosis, each one having a unique pathophysiology causing the metabolic acidosis. The way I remember these is by thinking about them alphabetically. In type 1 renal tubular acidosis, the problem is lack of acid secretion from the alpha cells. And I use the letter A, which is the first letter in the alphabet, to remind me that this is a type 1 renal tubular acidosis. So A is for acid. In type 2 renal tubular acidosis, the problem is the reabsorption of bicarbonate in the proximal convoluted tubule. So I use the letter B, which is the second letter in the alphabet, to remind me that this is a type 2 renal tubular acidosis. So B is for bicarbonate. In type 4 renal tubular acidosis is caused by hypoaldosteronism. And I use the letter O in hypoaldosteronism to remind me that this letter comes after A and B, so this must be the last type of renal tubular acidosis. Also, as a side note, type 4 renal tubular acidosis could also be caused by aldosterone resistance in addition to hypoaldosteronism. So let's pull up a blank slide in the next screen so I can show you how these work. In type 1 renal tubular acidosis, the alpha intercalated cell is ineffective. So this is an alpha intercalated cell and if this is an alpha intercalated cell of course we're talking about the collecting duct. So we know that water and carbon dioxide react to form hydrogen and bicarbonate. The bicarbonate is reabsorbed through a bicarb chloride antiporter and the hydrogen is secreted through a hydrogen ATPase and a hydrogen potassium exchanger or antiporter. In type 1 renal tubular acidosis, this process of secreting acid is defective. And if the patient is unable to secrete acid into the lumen of the nephron, then it will build up in the cell, so increased hydrogen in the cell. With excess protons, as drawn here, Le Chatier's principle dictates that the equation would begin to favor water and carbon dioxide. Therefore, you will have decreased generation of bicarbonate. So what would this do to the urine pH? Well, with decreased acid secretion, the urine pH would become alkalotic, or increase. In fact, the urine pH in this patient would be greater than 5.5. Now, it's important to recognize that urine pH can be normal from a range of 4.5 to around 8, but if a patient has persistently higher pH, unable to acidify it below 5.5, this is abnormal. Now what would happen to serum pH over here in the blood? Well, with decreased bicarb generation and reabsorption, decreased bicarbonate reabsorption, the serum pH would become more acidotic or decrease, causing a metabolic acidosis, hence the term renal tubular acidosis. Now what would happen to the serum potassium level? Well, as you can see, if the potassium hydrogen antiporter is dysfunctional, then less potassium would be reabsorbed. So less potassium. And therefore, serum potassium levels would decrease. In other words, the patient would be hypokalemic. Another question is what type of kidney stones would these patients be likely to develop and why? Well, with increased urinary pH, the environment is more suitable for calcium and phosphate to precipitate into stones. So patients with renal tubular acidosis type 1 have an increased risk for developing calcium phosphate stones because of the increased urinary pH. To summarize, patients with renal tubular acidosis type 1 have a dysfunctional alpha cell, which causes increased urinary pH, metabolic acidosis, 
and hypokalemia. Now let's move on to type 2 renal tubular acidosis. In type 2 renal tubular acidosis, the bicarbonate reabsorption is dysfunctional. So here is a proximal tubule cell, and recall that water and carbon dioxide can diffuse into the proximal convoluted tubule. They can then be converted into hydrogen or acid and bicarbonate. And the bicarbonate can then be reabsorbed and the hydrogen can then be secreted in order to bind with a, another filtered molecule of bicarbonate in order to restart the cycle. In renal tubular acidosis type 2, the process of reabsorbing bicarbonate is dysfunctional. Since bicarbonate cannot be recovered, this results in excess bicarbonate in the urine. So what would this do to urinary pH? Well, with decreased bicarbonate reabsorption and increased bicarbonate secretion, the urine pH would initially increase due to the high amount of bicarbonate in the urine. However, the blood would soon run low on bicarbonate because it is not being adequately reabsorbed. Therefore, less bicarbonate would be filtered by the glomerulus to enter the urine. So the urinary pH would eventually decrease and it would be below 5.5. Recall that normal urinary pH can be from 4.5 to eight. But these patients are unable to increase their urinary pH above five and a half, which is abnormal. Now what would happen to the serum pH here in the blood? Well, with decreased bicarbonate reabsorption, the serum pH would become more acidotic, or decrease, causing a metabolic acidosis. And for type 2 renal tubular acidosis, there are two potential causes to keep in mind. First is Fanconi syndrome. This is a condition in which the proximal tubule is generally dysfunctional and cannot reabsorb many of the things that it normally would. This includes glucose and amino acids and all of the other things that the proximal tubule normally reabsorbs, including bicarbonate. The second condition, often causing renal tubular acidosis type 2, is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, such as acetazolamide. The whole purpose of a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor is to decrease bicarbonate reabsorption. So it would make sense that prolonged use of a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor would cause renal tubular acidosis type 2. So finally, let's talk about type 4 renal tubular acidosis. So type 4 renal tubular acidosis results from anything that decreases aldosterone level. So I'll just write ALDO for short. And recall that aldosterone acts on the principal cells of the collecting duct, or right, PC up here, as well as the alpha cells of the collecting duct. If aldosterone is low, then the sodium-potassium pump will be downregulated. So the sodium reabsorption will decrease, and the potassium secretion will also decrease. So this patient would be retaining more potassium and be hyperkalemic. So what could low aldosterone do to the serum pH? Recall that on the luminal side of the alpha cell, there is a hydrogen ATPase, which secretes hydrogen. And aldosterone is responsible for upregulating this pump. So with decreased aldosterone, less acid will be secreted. So there will be decreased acid secretion. Decreased acid secretion will cause the bicarbonate chloride antiporter here on the basolateral side to be downregulated. So you'll be reabsorbing less bicarb in exchange for chloride. So the decreased bicarbonate reabsorption and the decreased acid secretion combined lead to a metabolic acidosis. So the pH will be decreased in the serum. So what would happen to the urinary pH? Well, with decreased hydrogen secretion, you would expect the pH to increase, becoming alkalotic. However, this is not the case. So let's dive into what really happens. So let's go to the proximal tubule. So it turns out that high levels of potassium in the blood cause a decrease in ammonia synthesis in the cells of the proximal tubule. So decreased ammonia synthesis. The mechanism isn't fully understood. But what is important is that hyperkalemia decreases 
ammonia synthesis. Therefore, there is less ammonia being secreted into the urine. So decreased ammonia in the urine. And recall that ammonia buffers protons that are filtered from the glomerulus. So with less ammonia binding up the protons in the urine, the pH will actually decrease, becoming more acidic. So let's go back to our other page with the collecting duct. So we know that the pH will actually decrease. So to summarize, patients with type 4 renal tubular acidosis will have metabolic acidosis, the low pH in the serum, and they will also have hyperkalemia, which will lead to decreased ammonia synthesis in the proximal tubule, therefore leading to a decreased urinary pH. So let's do a practice question. What would you expect the ammonium concentration to be in the urine in a patient with type 4 renal tubular acidosis? Well, recall that in the proximal convoluted tubule here, these patients will be producing less ammonia. So less ammonia will be secreted into the urine. So with less ammonia in the urine, there will be less binding of the acid that is secreted from the glomerulus. And therefore, there will be decreased production of ammonium. Let's do another question. Let's say a patient has amino aciduria and glucosuria. In other words, amino acids and glucose are being excreted into the urine. Well, if a patient has amino acids and glucose in the urine, which is totally abnormal, where must the defect be in the nephron? So let's draw out a nephron. So here we have the collecting duct, and here we have the proximal convoluted tubule. So another way to ask this question is, where are glucose and amino acids typically reabsorbed? Well, as mentioned earlier in this lecture, glucose and amino acids are reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. So the excretion of amino acids and glucose into the urine means that the proximal convoluted tubule is not performing its job correctly. And if the proximal tubule is not functioning properly, it will be unable to reabsorb bicarbonate. So bicarbonate reabsorption, which is a major function of the proximal tubule, would decrease. So with decreased bicarbonate reabsorption, there will be increased bicarbonate excretion in the urine. And with persistent waste of bicarb like this, there will be less bicarb in the blood to filter into the urine. So the bicarbonate, which normally will be filtered through the glomerulus and into the urine, would actually be decreased. So there will be decreased bicarbonate in the urine. So the urinary pH will actually be decreased. This will be below 5.5. So what type of renal tubular acidosis is this? Remember B for bicarb reabsorption. B for bicarb reabsorption, which means it's the second type of renal tubular acidosis. So RTA type 2. So let's review what your book says. In type 1 renal tubular acidosis, the defect is in acid secretion in the collecting duct. This will lead to an increased urinary pH. Type 2 renal tubular acidosis is a defect in bicarbonate reabsorption from the proximal tubule, which leads to decreased bicarbonate in the urine, so the pH of the urine will be decreased or more acidic. And finally, type 4 renal tubular acidosis is caused by low aldosterone or aldosterone resistance. And this would cause decreased ammonia secretion from the proximal tubule and therefore excess acids in the urine causing the pH of the urine to also be decreased. And as the name implies, renal tubular acidosis means that the patient has a metabolic acidosis. And as mentioned earlier, this lecture laid out the processes of each of the parts of the nephron, but nephron physiology is really best understood as a whole. So in the next video, we will dive into the various applications of nephron physiology so you can ace your board exam.